Hi everyone, welcome back. Before we get started on these stories, I need to give a warning for story number two for sexual violence. The story mentions some pretty graphic stuff, so if you want to avoid stories like that, now you know. I'll also have that story labeled in the timestamps just in case you want to skip it. Also, if you want to send a story my way, you can send it at southerncannibal.com or you can email it at southerncannibalstories at gmail.com. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to send in your story. It really helps the channel a lot. Anyways, if you're all ready to get started, let's begin. I'm a 20 year old female, about 5 foot 4 and 110 pounds. The story begins in 2022 when I was 17 turning 18. Before graduating high school, I had joined my college's Facebook group. I decided to make a Snapchat group chat with six other people that actually wanted to talk. Us six seemed to be getting along pretty well. When it came time to pick roommates, one girl we'll call Amanda had asked to be roommates with me. I was pretty excited that someone wanted me as their roommate. We had talked on the phone and through text a lot, but I hadn't met her in person. Soon came orientation where Amanda and I finally met. She seemed like she wouldn't kill me, so I had remained confident in my roommate selection. We all kept talking, and soon enough it was move-in day. Something I should mention is going into college I had a boyfriend named Jacob. We had started dating in May, and I had fully intended on breaking up with him before school started in September. He wouldn't let me, but that's a story for another time. Amanda knew of Jacob, but they had never met. He would sometimes be in my snaps or in the background of phone calls, but that's it. This will make sense later. My college had us freshmen move in a week before classes started so that we could get situated and everything. On the first day, the local Target had let the new students take over, meaning students went on the bus and got to roam around the Target to look for any last minute things. During this Target takeover, I met Jason. My friend Adam knew him. And when Adam introduced me to Jason, we quickly became best friends. Since Jason and I were both in relationships, neither of us were really looking for anything more than friends. Flash forward a few weeks, and Jason and I spent every day together. In each other's rooms, walking to class, even getting food together and going on little walks around our new town. Some of our friends would joke about us dating. We even started making kissy faces at each other in front of them just as a joke. Amanda seemed almost jealous, but of who? One night she and a friend tagged along as Jason and I went swimming. They didn't swim, just kinda watched us jump off the rocks and swim back. I didn't think much of it since it was still fun to be there. A few days later, Amanda and her friend Hannah, Jason, and I went to Target to pick up a few things for our room. Jason and I were making faces at each other as they had walked ahead. We had been joking back and forth all day about how we were each too chicken to actually kiss. So I did it. I kissed him in the target. It was just a peck, but I had fell in love with him. Then I felt guilty, thinking about Jacob. I had confided in my roommate about what I should do, and she went crazy. She texted Jason's girlfriend and made me call Jacob and tell him everything or else she would. The way she acted, you would have thought they were lifelong friends. She then took my phone and then prevented me from leaving my room to go see Jason. She unlocked my phone and then blocked Jason on everything. I tried to put up a fight, but she was bigger and stronger than me, and she said that she wouldn't give it back until I calmed down. So I pretended to, but I had to sneak out of my own room. She noticed when that loud-ass door slammed and then chased me down the hall and actually dragged me by my hair back to our room. We had passed by people in the hall, and to say that I was embarrassed is an understatement. Jason and I had a class together, and we ended up talking in the following days. He told me that his girlfriend said if she finds out we're hanging out again, she'll leave him. He didn't want to stop being friends, and neither did I. So we had started sneaking around. I was finally able to break up with my boyfriend. A week or so later, Jason had broke up with his girlfriend, and then we actually started officially dating. Again, I told my roommate, and she said that typical phrase, once a cheater, always a cheater, and then said good luck. In my head, I just rolled my eyes. 
Whatever, I said to myself. I fell asleep that night like any other, with my headphones in and my ASMR playing. I was facing the wall and I had woken up to the feeling of being watched. With my best acting skills, I had turned around like I was adjusting in my sleep and I had my eyes slightly open. There she was, in the middle of the room, just watching me. All I could see was her silhouette, but I just knew she was looking because when she went back to bed, she had turned her body. I honestly just forgot all about it in the morning, and I thought it was just a weird dream or something. Jason and I would spend a lot of time in each other's room since we lived in the same building, which resulted in late night returns. Amanda didn't seem to mind, and it started telling me about her own little love affairs. We would always text each other whenever we had guys over, and then again when it was all clear. She almost always walked in on us too early though, claiming that she forgot or didn't see my text, though I know she did. I understood that it was her room too, but if she had to come back, why didn't she text me first? She would also go around telling people whenever I texted her. I remember one time her friend walked in on us too. Before that happened, I had asked if she would mind if Jason slept over some nights. She said he could, and so that became a thing. Jason and I would sleep in each other's rooms often. It didn't bother anyone. Until one night when sleeping in my room, Jason woke up to see Amanda watching us. I'll admit, Jason and I were a little scared of her. I mean, this was the second time this happened, and that was just what we knew of. Time went by and she was just getting weirder and weirder. We started avoiding each other a lot. I would come home to find my things used or out of place. Also, her side of the room was always a mess. I mean, it's not like I'm super neat, but I kept up with my trash and laundry and expected the same. But no. At the beginning of the semester, we had to make a roommate agreement. I said that I didn't mind sharing makeup and clothes as long as she had asked. With our RA there, she agreed, but soon after, I realized that she didn't mean it. She must have memorized my schedule since I had never caught her doing this before. Most nights after coming back from dance practice, the team and I would go get food at the dining hall. One night I wasn't hungry, so I just went to my room to drop off my dance bag. I walked in on her standing up from my desk with this look on her face like she had just gotten caught. I saw my makeup out of place and mascara smudges and hair dye stains on my desk. Her and her friends would do other things to my stuff too. For example, they had broke a plastic flower that I'd used as a decoration. They tore it apart and then scattered it on my desk. They also erased what I had put on my whiteboard and drew some weird diagram that said, the more you fuck around, the more we find out. So weird. Towards the end of the year, Jason and I would go to my parents' house on the weekends for dinner, and we would sleep over there sometimes. One time we had spent the entire weekend there. I had wanted to bring my computer to do homework just in case we did sleep over, but Jason wanted to beat traffic, so we left school as soon as I finished dance practice. When I came back to school, my computer was actually shattered. I know for a fact that I didn't do this. I confronted Amanda, but she denied it. I had to leave for class, so I texted her and I told her to be honest. That I won't get mad, I won't make her pay to fix it, I just want to know what happened. She started getting really aggressive with me. She started calling me names and then threatened me. I had called my mom for her opinion on this because she's practically my best friend and I had asked my RA as well. They both told me to file a police report, so I walked down and sat with an officer and then told him everything. They must have called her to the station the next day, because that night as I was getting out of the shower, I was followed back to my room by Amanda's weirdly aggressive friend who I've never even met before. Let me repeat, I was followed to my room wearing nothing but a towel by a stranger. She was obviously Amanda's friend, but I had never seen this literal giant before in my life. She was yelling threats at me and calling me the N-word, which by the way, I'm white. As I rushed to my door that's across from our lounge, I saw my lovely roommate and her other stupid friends in there yelling at me, calling me a rat and a hoe and other cute original nicknames. What a psycho. I called my boyfriend Jason and told him to meet me in my room. He was also coming out of the shower, 
but he went the other way to avoid this giant screaming freak. Was she waiting for me? Were they all waiting for me? What the hell was she going to do? My mom theorized that Amanda actually had some sort of crush on me. Others say she just doesn't know how to be a roommate. I don't really know for sure though. So Amanda, please keep your odd self and loud friends far away from me and Jason. Which by the way, Jason and I are now engaged and we have a beautiful baby girl. We're doing really good now in our lives. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to my story about my psychotic roommate. And please stay safe out there. I wish to share a true crime account story that my grandmother Grace told me when I was a teenager shortly before she passed away. The story comes with a strong warning of sex and violence and an adult with a minor. So anybody not wanting to listen, please skip this story. My great-grandmother's name was Grace. I won't use her last name for privacy reasons. She was born and raised in the state of Alabama in 1933 during the Great Depression. The Great Depression in America lasted from 1929 to 1939. It was hard all over the United States but so tough in the South with all the jobless people, crops failing, and all the bread and soup lines. People just didn't have enough to eat. My great-grandmother's father was a farmer, and he owned a small farm and did pretty well for himself and his family. He was even kind enough to share his food from his farm with his neighbors as well as other needy people, so he was well-liked in the area. Well, Grace and the family and the rest of the country, thanks to God, made it through the Great Depression. It was now 1946, and Grace was now a 13-year-old teenager. Grace grew into a lovely teenage girl with long brown hair. She often wore a big red or pink bow in the back of it. She also had a busty and curvy figure that attracted many boys to her. Grace looked very pretty in her body-hugging dresses and nice pairs of shoes, and she knew it. Well, one of the many boys attracted to her was actually a man of 20 years old named Homer Garland Odin. Homer was out of school and was a bad boy type. He was deadly looking but good looking, with his dark brown hair with long sideburns and a nice beard. He wore a black leather jacket and motorcycle boots on his feet. Homer loved to smoke camel cigarettes. The age difference was a problem and it was against the law with Homer being 20 years old and Grace only 13, but they were secretive about it. Homer used to pick up Grace. No, not at her house, but just around the corner so her parents couldn't see how old he was. They wouldn't approve of a man like this with their daughter. Homer had a nice black motorcycle, and he also took Grace to hamburger joints and malt shops. They even had fun dancing together to the late 1940s big bands on Saturday nights. My great-grandmother Grace once asked Homer where he got his money. Homer simply replied that he worked as a local mechanic around the corner. Grace knew though that he probably did some illegal stuff on the side also, because he seemed like he always had enough money to spend on her, which she loved. Homer was usually really nice to Grace, but he did have a temper when angry because she saw him beat up quite a few boys that crossed him. One day, Homer had asked Grace if she would like to have sex with him. Grace, who had several boyfriends and had kissed quite a few of them, just wasn't quite ready for this step just yet. After all, she was still only 13 years old in 1946. But one night alone with Homer in her father's barn, Homer got really rough with Grace. He forced her up the hayloft and then raped her. He really did a number on her, and he hurt her badly. Thrust so powerful that she almost passed out a couple of times. Back then, it was a little different than today. You didn't tell your parents if you were raped by somebody, but just kept it under wraps. And that's exactly what my great-grandmother Grace did. Even though she really wanted to tell somebody what he did to her, she was just too afraid to. Plus, if she did and everybody in town found out, she would be labeled as a tramp and a whore, and she certainly didn't want that. Alabama at this time had the electric chair for rape and murder, and if Grayson told the police what Homer did to her, Homer could have been put in the electric chair. 
The Alabama electric chair was called Yellow Mama back then because it was painted with the same yellow paint that they used to make highway lines. My great-grandmother Grace told me that even though Homer had raped her, they had still remained friends, even though they didn't date anymore. Homer had moved on with other girls his own age, which was safer for the both of them. Homer owned a 38 caliber revolver handgun that he had loved to shoot tin cans with in the back of his home, which was a huge field to shoot guns. When Homer was dating Grace, he'd even had her shoot his gun from time to time, helping her aim it at the tin cans for them to shoot. Grace didn't like guns, so she only tried his handgun just a few times, and that was it. Seeing Homer with his gun was chilling. Grace knew that a bad boy like him had probably robbed some stores before. That's probably how he got all that extra money to spend on his motorcycle, as well as the pretty young girls that he loved to take out on dates. So Grace thought to herself. Then the fateful day came on February 8th, 1949. Grace had heard that somebody had shot and killed the small grocery store owner, William Alexander McDonald, who was 71 years old at the time. Well, Homer had killed him because the grocery store owner refused to give him the sack of money when he was closing up the store for the night. There were no eyewitnesses to the crime, but several witnesses saw Homer loitering around the small grocery store that afternoon until dark waiting for it to close. He was doing that so he could rob the place. This suspicion caused the police to arrest him. Homer confessed to the murder as soon as the police arrested him, and he also told them where the gun was in his home that he used to kill the man with. While Homer was in jail, he had confessed again to the killing. In jail, things did not look good for Homer. It was now 1950, and an electrocution date for him was set on July 21st, 1950 in the electric chair called Yellow Mama. My great-grandmother Grace wanted to go to the Kilby prison in Alabama to say one last goodbye to Homer but there was no way her parents would let her. They never liked him much anyway, and they grounded her severely for going out with such a dangerous man like this. Once they had found out all that happened between them, Grace told me that her parents were probably very happy to see Homer fry in that electric chair. Plus, how dare Homer for violating their underage daughter? This was truly unforgivable to them. Homer ordered what he wanted for his last meal, which was meatloaf with mashed potatoes and corn on the cob on the side with a soda pop. He was planning at first to throw the food tray at the guards. Once receiving his meal, though, he had changed his mind because he was hungry and he couldn't let that good food go to waste, since it was, after all, his final meal before going into eternity. After this, he did talk to his mother, saying that he was sorry for everything he did and that he hoped that she would forgive him. Homer also got one last prayer from the prison chaplain, too, before he was set to walk his last mile to the electric chair. My great-grandmother Grace knew that Homer was probably nervous walking to the chair as he had chewed a large wad of gum walking there, but he never showed it. He was a tough guy, and he wanted to die as one. While Homer was strapped to the chair and a hood was placed over his face, they waited for one last call from the Alabama governor. James E. Folsom Sr. to halt the execution, but none came as the executioner then threw the switch. Homer Garland Odom was a strong boy, but the electric chair was stronger. Homer was dead within two minutes of throwing the switch. His gravestone now reads, Homer Garland Odom, born June 27, 1926, died July 21, 1950, gone but not forgotten. Homer Garland Odom was only 24 years old, not quite a month of 24 either. Very sad. What a wasted life he led, my great-grandmother Grace thought. She felt way more sorry, though, for the kind-hearted grocery store owner, William Alexander McDonald. He didn't deserve to get murdered in such a manner, but Homer did deserve to fry for it. Grace said she did still have feelings for Homer, though as she would sometimes put roses on his gravestones before she had moved to another part of Alabama and then got married and started her family. Even though Homer was a bad man, he admired the good of Grace and he wished he was more like her. At least that's what he said to her once. It wasn't just Grace's good looks that he liked. He liked her good heart and positive manner about life as well. Here's where the story ends. Take the story of what you will, people. 
My great-grandmother Grace just wanted to share a story of a bad man that she knew from a really long time ago in her youth, as well as the crime he did and its punishment. I hope that Homer found some peace, but I highly doubt he's in a good place.